Welcome, welcome to the show, Speak Up Monday, episode number 348. Round of applause. Oh, look at that. So as you can hear, we have a live studio audience which you can join. It's free. It's here at Tropical Nomad every Monday. Come at 6 o'clock for a 6.30 go live or slightly there before. Now, as you know, uh, my name is Robert Ian Bonick. Uh, I'm known as a partnerships and tourism architect. So that means that I'm a bridge between foreign investment, uh, government, and private enterprise here. I basically help uh, people in their venture building. So companies that want to move here to Bali and Indonesia at large, and those also here in Bali and Indonesia at, at large on business solutions. And as you can see from this shirt here I'm wearing, the funding, uh, co-founder of the funding. The funding is uh, the biggest platform for entrepreneurism and investment in Indonesia. It's a very comprehensive platform. So, so yeah, just check it out. We'll talk about that later on. But this evening, uh, we have, a, well, we have a, I would call you a good friend, mate. I would call Bo yeah. Holmgreen, I would call you a good friend. And so Bo is CEO of Scholars of Sustenance. Now, for those of you who haven't heard of it, I'll say it again, maybe a bit slower. So Scholars of Sustenance. So the, the little, uh, little title there gives away what it is. So it is uh, the largest um, food rescue non-profit in Southeast Asia, all right? Just to give you an idea, and you're in, obviously, in Indonesia, in Thailand, and the Philippines, and, uh, and I guess at the most, uh, at the most geared up, you've, you've probably got over 3,000 people working uh, within, that, within that organization, including volunteers and so on, and the last thing I'd say, 25 million meals is what you've contributed to those in need uh, within those three places. So I guess the first question is, what the hell, <laughs> what the hell got into your mind to even think about doing something like that? Well, first of all, I have to say that I set the goal back in 2016, and I thought we'd never make 25 million meals, right? But then we made it, it was gonna be 25 by 25, right? But we made it in 2022. So we just raised the goal to 50. <laughs> but what got into me? I don't know. I, I spent my whole life optimizing, right? We uh, had a software company. We were selling uh, mathematical optimization. Sounds very fancy. And, um, and just sitting in a hotel on top in Bangkok one day and seeing the food at the happy hour being thrown away. And then, you know, it was disgusting. 95% of all that beautiful food from five to seven was taken out. So I went up to the reception and I said, you, you get to take this home, right? No, sir, if we take it home, you know, we'd be fired. So then what do we do with it? it put it in the trash. You mean a container I can see down there? Yes, but there's a wall and then there's people on the other side of the wall and, and don't they crawl over at night to take this food? No, sir, we have guards with guns. It's like, whoa. Forget optimizing for business, right? We need to optimize for people. And that's where it all started. So, so that's what we did. And we had to, uh, you know, first talk to all the hotels in particular. Give us your food. No, you're going to poison people. Right? Yeah, okay, so we had to tell them that we took responsibility and so on. But we had to create a system to lift it out of their world safely. And then cool change technology and put it back into another world to all the recipients, right? So... When you see our trucks now raising up to Karangasam, Tabanan, whatever, right? I mean, those trucks are cool, nice food. It's been inspected. There's total food safety, right? Six, six and a half years now. We haven't, we haven't killed anybody yet. <laughs> That's our claim to fame, I guess. Oh, no. uh, look, we're, uh, we'll, we'll delete the word yet. Um, <laughs> so look, you know, there might be people here, and I know some of them, right, who are inspiring human beings, right? They, like us, are like, how do we bring different elements together and create something magical that helps a lot of people, right? And if we can make some money in, in the process, even better, right? Come on, let's, it has to be sustainable too. Um, so look, if I, if I would ask you, uh, if there's three to five key steps to start something like Scholars of Sustenance, for those people who are there wondering, maybe I want to do something, maybe not in the same area, but want to contribute in a different area, what would you say? Well, it's not fair to talk about Scholars of Sustenance, or SOS, right? But because 
you know, by then we could afford to start it and, and do the seed money and, and so on, right? You've you got to go back and, and talk about starting from scratch on something, right? Yeah. And, and that's more important for your yeah, funding is entrepreneurial, right? And uh, I was entrepreneur of the year back in North Carolina. And uh, if I learned anything, uh, I don't know if I can get to three or five, right? But uh, never give up. And then growing up in Denmark, there was one thing that I have to say is so totally different to America, but I learned from it. In Denmark, if you start a company and you fail, oh, you failed, well, go find a job, right? In America, it's like, you failed, well, great, try again. You learn something, try again, try again, right? And that is a mentality difference that I have to admire, you know, if you really keep at it, never give up, and just uh, keep trying, then eventually, It'll work, right? But there is a lot of ups and downs on the way. I was bankrupt. I don't know how many times. <laughs> it's okay. You know, the, the, the mentality, right? Uh, many people here in business or people watching, maybe in business as well, and we keep hearing this thing about, you know, if you fail, try again. Um, you will succeed, right? And you've got people like Conor Sanders who succeeded, I think, in his 80s or something, right? Yeah. Um, so, I mean, like, if I asked you, you know, like, what is it? that keeps you coming back through all of those trials and tribulations, if there was something that you could pass on to people, what would the key essence be, apart from never give up? Well, first of all, you have to burn for what you're not giving up, right? So the best thing you can do is if you find something you're burned for, then it isn't work. Then it's basically just continuing your hobby into something grand and so on and get the recognition uh, for it. But, but it is really burning for something. If you don't burn for it, you can't give it up and find something else, right? But if you burn for it, you never give up. Mm, love it. And look, so let's um, dive a bit deeper into your business because you mentioned in North Carolina. So maybe give people a bit of a... I know that you're also a mentor as well. So give us a bit of, um, a bit of that background to give people an idea because I think people think <coughs> a non-profit, they think that, oh, it's run by a bunch of... Sorry. Uh, <laughs> hippies. Sorry. So I didn't say that. I, d I didn't say that word. Okay, I did. I'm sorry. I apologize. Um, but yeah, they don't necessarily realize that to run a nonprofit, you need to be good at business, right? But tell us a little bit about your business background, and then we can tease out the key elements that of that business background came in to be very useful in building what you're doing now. There's one language that the whole world can talk, which is numbers. And, and if you know numbers and you're into numbers, you can build up because at least you measure and you know. But there's got to be a passion. And, and uh, again, you... You got to burn for something. You got to uh, have the passion for it. So it's it's really down to just continuing. Mm. Right? And then, so tell us a little bit more about your background, because I know that you yeah. were there's some networks, some business entrepreneurial networks in the U.S. that also yeah. awarded you something as well from memory. Yeah, but I mean, I started in Denmark as an en engineer, right? And uh, they sent me to America, and the company went bankrupt a month later. <laughs> I was the last employee negotiating them out of contracts. And uh, from there, it was hard, getting a work permit in America. I wanted to stay and so on. And, and uh, it, it was not easy. But again, not giving up. Just keep trying. My best friend had to be the uh, owner of the company until uh, I could join. And uh, just keep trying. So, so we did that for over 20 years. And uh, we did, like I say, mathematical optimization for banks. And uh, so we traveled all over the world, installed these software systems for large banks. We saved them millions of dollars just by thinking a little smarter, right? Instead of letting it flow, you can, you can actually optimize a little bit of where the money should be in your network and so on and save a lot of money. Mm. So. And, and how would you say that mindset, because again, engineer mindset, maybe people think, you know, there's this um, systematic approach to something, right? Maybe that's it. It's a systematic approach. I use this approach and I can break it down. I can find what's missing. But also what I detect in you is this fluidity, Right, this way of you know thinking. You said it outside of the box. So, so how would you say if it connects? Um, does being an, en an engineer connect to solving challenges that you faced, maybe operationally, uh, with well, 25 million meals, uh, 3,000 staff, <laughs> over three different countries? Well, uh, I think uh, the best thing is to go back to uh, Denmark, where my High school teachers, they all told me that I was better at language than mathematics. Don't think of an engineer. No way. You have to be in languages, right? Well, my dad pushed me a little bit because he was an engineer, and then I became an engineer. And that's maybe the best thing that I have now that I can actually write uh, 
poetically, and, and also engineering. I'm not here to say whether it's better to be an engineer or not, right? We're all very different people, and everybody brings something to the table. Engineers can look at things logically and, and build it, and I know I'm driving SOS people crazy because I, I say we are a, um, an environmental organization, first and foremost. Yes, we happen to feed 25 million people, but, but it is to, to avoid the, the, food, the excess foods going to the landfill. So it is numbers and numbers and numbers, right? But we measure the CO2 that's avoided in the world, and then we measure the meals and the kilos and all the other things, right? But, but if we didn't do that, it would be a free-for-all, and, and nobody would grow it, right? So every year we grow it like a business. It is like a non-profit business, basically. Mm. And look, we spoke a little bit before about, you know, when you have a big dream, right, and you're going for it all the way, you're going to have your detractors. You're going to have people who maybe didn't have a great experience uh, working with you, uh, maybe who maybe heard something from someone else and decided that that was true without checking the facts, and then spruiked that rumor, right? So then how do you, you know, deal with, you know, bad publicity or bad press or people talking in a negative way about scholars of sustenance or something that you've done? What's your mindset, heart set? How do you get through it and power through? You just shed it off and you move forward. There's no, no point. You can't argue. Social media now makes it impossible for people to say anything, and you can't argue. In fact, if you try to argue, it's worse. So just ignore it, move ahead, and, and just uh, think that the best will always, uh, the, the good will win, right? And uh, we're going to talk, I, I suppose, a little bit about the, the studio, but the, the subtitle of our action movie says it all. Karma is the best revenge. Mm. <laughs> and if you believe in karma, then, you know, just let people do what they do. Right? And if somebody else thinks that they should be punished, fine. Let, but, but it shouldn't be you. I mean, you can never win the argument. Mm. <laughs> so then, it, was there anything, uh, going back a bit further now, right? Uh, so you grew up in Denmark, right? So, like, tell us a little bit, a little bit about that. Because, again, uh, working with you, and we'll get to that, later, you know, like, you do have this, uh, this can-do attitude, right? But it's natural for you, right? It's like, yeah, yeah, but we do this. Um, you know, we've got the Million Mills March coming up soon, you know? We, we want to get more people there, you know? Ah, oh, it, it, it will work out, right? Where does this sense of optimism, if I can call it that, where, where, does, that, where does that come from? It's a good question. My sister always told me when I came back from America to Denmark to stop waving my arms around and, and speak, you know, more low and so on, right? But no, I mean, in Denmark, we are very calm and quiet. And generally, you come out of school and you find yourself a job in a big company. We don't have a lot of entrepreneurs in that cold country. Still go back there, still love it. But this positive influence came from America. Got it. And so entrepreneurism, right? So obviously the funding uh, T-shirt here, guys, it's all about entrepreneurism in Indonesia uh, and about how can we support it. And there's so many different moving parts to the funding. It's pre-seed and seed investment. It's, uh, you know, from podcast, education, um, to uh, the funding show. It's like a shark tank-like show where we, um, yeah, receive pitches and, uh, and the, the winner has the opportunity to be funded one coming up in May, and, but it will be become a private equity firm that will have its own investments and so on. So this entrepreneurial spirit that you have, North Carolina, you, you managed to avoid telling us the, the awards that, you, that were bestowed upon you. I'm going to get it out of you eventually, right? Um, so entrepreneurism, Indonesia, like what do you see with all the stuff that you've hired over the years, people that you've seen, this Indonesian or this Balinese spirit, what do you see in terms of entrepreneurism and how have you contributed to that or what do you think it needs? Um, not from a, a top-down point of view, but on the ground, like working together. What do you think, how can foreigners help this whole scenario of entrepreneurism, that entrepreneurial spirit in, in here, for example? I think to find people's passion, they sometimes circle around it and can't see it themselves. So if we can, long before we start talking about seed funding and so on, to help people find out what it is they're good at and what they would like to do. If you stand on the bridge and all the trains are going below you and you just jump without knowing, you can do that and you can actually be lucky, right? But you have to first know what it is you want. And, and most people don't know that at a younger age, right? So 
-hmm. So experience from the funding can help. And then it's a cultural thing. The, one of the downsides in Indonesia is that in school, they are not taught at, as a child to appreciate education. I mean, not, uh, this is a very broad statement, but a lot of the people that I met over the years don't have that same thinking. And that's why I guess I was lucky growing up in Denmark because if there's one thing we believe in, it's education, because education means we treat each other very nicely. And, and uh, uh, it's just a, a social welfare, right? We really take care of people <laughs> in Denmark. So from that perspective, um, you need to first get them to understand not that thing or that thing that they want to do, but, but who they are. And you're pitching, you know, the, the judges will be able to help a little bit. And, but after the pitching and after you get them some funding, that's where the test is, right? Mm. You know, the, the, the thing which I find... Uh, Interesting, right, about, for want of a better word, so Southeast Asia, right, we know we're in the region of the world which is set to boom, become what the fourth largest economy in the world pretty soon, and all the fundamentals uh, are looking extremely good compared to other parts of the world. Uh, and we, we, I've gone deep into this in other episodes, that's not for, to, not for tonight, but doing business in Thailand, doing business in the Philippines, what are the the differences, maybe one or two major ones between those areas and doing business here, maybe in Indonesia or let's say Bali? Well, Indonesia or Bali, because those are yeah. two very thing, uh, different things. We're opening up in Jakarta now, right? And it is very different. I think, um, like everybody else, when we started in 16, I had done a lot of business in, in the region, but I still thought, okay, I've done in Thailand, now let's go to Indonesia, right? I forgot that Buddhists think differently than Muslims and, and so on, right? It's, it's so, you start with the fundamentals. And then uh, you read, uh, okay, this is SOS, so uh, Indonesia is the second worst food waster in the world, right? So we have to be there. And we had all the statistics and so on, but then we ran into all these other things where it's not easy to do. But overall, it's not easy in any of the countries. Same in Thailand, right? But, but now we're working with the prime minister and, you know, it's, it's, now it's gotten to a level where it's respected, right? It's a little harder in Indonesia so far. I mean, when I, I was a speaker at the G20, right? And I met all the ministers and so on, and, and it inspired us to do even more, right? That's why we're opening in Jakarta, basically. But uh, there, is, there are some fundamentals that you have to think of, and, and one of them is, like I said, um, the innovation is not as big. But at the same time, this country is changing, right? The, uh, this country, uh, the average age, 27 years old, that's fantastic, right? So this country, probably in my mind, the fourth biggest population in the world, 27 years average, this country has more promise than anywhere else in the world if it is allowed to do it, right? So, so I think there is so much. The funding, I mean, if you can inspire entrepreneurs here and give them that little spark that maybe they weren't given at school, but now they can see the world and they also especially maybe in Bali, can see that it actually pays off to do some things, then it's mm. pure gold. You know, and so are you, uh, if you're around, the third microphone. So in, in a short while, uh, we're going to pass around this third microphone here. If you have any questions, just raise your hand. We'd like this to be interactive as well, right? It's not just two people talking, right? Minimum we, three we, each. We, we, we want to hear from you. So, so are you, yeah, so the microphone is here, my darling. And uh, so just... Take it with you, and uh, and then then we'll then we'll hear from any questions in a second. So million meals march. So let's talk about that. So what is it? What's it for? How many years has it been going? And and uh, and what can people do to contribute? Yeah, it's real simple. It's a third year we're doing it. We also have the million meals paddle, which is uh, you know on paddle boards. But this is a march. It happens in Tapanan, where we walk through the most fantastic. Uh, rice paddies, and it's just so gorgeous, right? We have a 5K and a 15K. Last year, we had a 25K, and God bless him, uh, a, a man and his mother was walking it, and she was 73, uh, is 73, well, by now 74, I guess, right? But amazing, but it took a long time. So we, we now keep it to 5 and 15, and uh, yeah, sign up, and uh, on March 5th, uh, we all meet. Uh, we have buses going up there as well uh, from uh, strategic locations, Anur and here and whatever. And then we, uh, we go up there, we walk, and then we have a barbecue on the beach um, in Tapanan afterwards. And if you haven't seen the beach in Tapanan, there's some very nice beaches up there. It is black sand, but it is absolutely gorgeous. 
And what's it for? It is to raise money for meals, right? So because we, our principle is that we basically get free, free food, right? Everything is excess foods. We go to hotels, supermarkets, and so on, and the food we get is free. They give it to us because they don't want to throw it away. So we have to spit it through real fast, same day, because it may be expiring in a couple of days, right? But it's free food. So all we have to do is pay for our own existence, the transportation, the trucks, and all this stuff. So our average cost per meal is 3.5 thousand rupiah. Right. So we can simply pump so much through, and, and that is why every dollar that, that this march raises will go to, to get lots of meals. <laughs> Got it. Great. Now, any questions? Uh, yep. So, Gossi, just grab it, actually, brother. Yeah, you, you're right there. And by the way, with these microphones, just pointing them at your mouth down here doesn't work so well. Hello, uh, Mr. Bo. Thank you Hello. so much for your, I don't know, like creating impact to the world. Very lovely. I'm a fan of, uh, you know, Robert knows I'm a fan of people that is really creating a positive impact in the world. So my question is basically, because I was working actually in the restaurant um, in a five-star hotel in Germany. I used to be a chef, so I know exactly what you're talking about when they are like cooking for 200 people and then the half of them, you know, just throw it away. And I was sad seeing that coming from country where it was hard actually to get food for my family. So how was actually the approach, um, so your organization to these restaurants and um, how did you talk with them, like ed you did education or you got real systems? So I would love to know the details of the system, how you approach to them and how everything's work until it goes to the point from the restaurant and it's not getting, getting west or it gets to people's mouth. Yes. Well, the approach is, uh, was the hard part, right? Because like I said in the beginning, you had a lot of naysayers, like you talked about. Oh, it can't be done. Oh, there are no poor people in Thailand, hungry people or anything, right? It was ridiculous, the statements people made. But they were all in their own world. Just like here, we've had so many people, local residents of Bali, who come up on their trucks in Karangasam and have tears in their eyes because they had no idea that people live like that on this island, right? So when we approach the hotels, we have to tug a little bit of the heartstrings. We have to talk to the management, make sure they understand it. Problem is, they don't know how much food they're throwing away. And when we point it out to them by, oh, thank you for giving us 500 kilos of food, the general manager says, what? Why are we throwing away that much? Right? So we, all, we have to work with them. But overall, now that we ha have no bad incidents in so many years, we can prove it is safe and then we can get it out to the people who really need it. That's our second biggest challenge. Actually, the first one is getting the food. Second one is finding the recipients that really need it, because it's not enough to just give, I can stop anybody in the street corner, you want free food, right? But we have to get it to the people who really need it, so. So anyway, we go through that and, and we make sure we, we sign uh, uh, you know, contracts, we take the responsibility, we anonymize the food, it can never come back to haunt them. And once they come on board, then it helps. And, and uh, in Philippines, for instance, we, we've not been operational for so long, but, but uh, there, a lot of the chefs already know us now, right, from Thailand and so on. So it helps to, to just be a known factor. So now people trust that SOS can do this safely. And everybody, like you had it back then, you see the waste, but there's no way you can stand in the kitchen and then get it to the right destinations and people, right? Correct. So it goes into the trash. So we simply have to just be the trash people for food, right? We're cheaper than the trash people because we are free. And then we take it to the right people, to the, to the, to the need that, that needs to be satisfied. Thank you. And how do you manage, basically, the running costs of the people that you are going through that, like the trucks and stuff? So through the donation or through uh, yes. your running business that you're putting also inside there? Yeah, well, the, there is a foundation in America with some money to for seed money, right? So we buy the first truck and, and start the first employees and so on and get it running. It has taken a few years, but like Thailand now, uh, which has 14 cooling trucks going around in four locations, five soon, and uh, they are racing. Um, but, but basically, they are now paying for themselves, right? So we kickstart it, and then we see it grow. So now we have uh, very big companies in Thailand paying for, for all the existence. So you got like a sponsor, or you got grants from yep. governments as yep. well. Grants, that sponsors, and then events and so on, like the Million Meals March. But it's all about, we got to have some income before we can make it happen, right? But here in Bali, we're still far behind. And, and uh, I, I hate to say it, but here in Bali, we're behind in food, too. Um, I don't know what happened, but in Thailand, with a sandbox experiment, right, they got out of COVID in some other way, right? So I always compare Bali and Phuket, because they're two hospita hospitality islands, right? Airplanes, hotels, and so on. 
Well, Phuket now has uh, over 10 times the amount of rescue food in SOS than we do here. And it just seems that the hotels here and the supermarkets are a little reluctant. We had so much here before COVID, but we haven't been able to get it out. So, so we are now hiring people to go out and really punch them in the nose and get them to give up the food. Right? And once they see it, like you say, the approach, right? But once they understand what we're about and that we're safe, then it's not a problem. But we've got to get to that point. And, and uh, s there's always staff rotation. So after COVID, I guess it's taking a little while, right? So, but we'll get there soon. <laughs> Thank you. Last question, if I may ask. Yeah, my brother. Um, so, so the target was like restaurant and hotels or some that. And is there any target, like, for example, farmers? or market where they actually have problems also sometimes to deliver the food or there is some foods that is like not being accepted in a supermarket or something like yes. that. You're also targeting yes. those? Or oh, we go a lot for ugly food that is not good enough yes. or in a five-star restaurant food that has been cooked but doesn't look good enough or has been overcooked. So yes, absolutely we go after all that. Restaurants generally are a little small uh, for, for us to do the transport but uh, a hotel with six restaurants, right? They can easily do it. We always tell the story about the biggest hotel in Southeast Asia, the Marriott Marquis up in uh, Bangkok, right? They have a refrigerator on the second floor and the seventh floor, and they just fill it up. And before COVID, uh, they gave us 250 kilos of food every single day from God. one hotel. Yeah. yeah. And some, wow. of the, some of the big supermarkets. Uh, hold on a second. 200 250 kilos yes. per day. Per day. And we have some of the big supermarkets up there also giving in the range of two to 250 kilos every single day. And if they did, before they gave it to us, straight to the landfill, right? So, I mean, and, and I've looked at this food. I mean, I can eat this food. It's beautiful. Yeah. Vegetables yeah. wrapped sure. in plastic that expires in two days, but still is it just, absolutely it just perfect. Look, it just doesn't look perfect for a supermarket because they, they don't put it there. So I, Yeah, I and same in, in hotels yeah. and so on, right? It has to be perfect. And that's the thing we have to teach these uh, general managers, that you can only reduce food waste so much by being more efficient and save money and so on, but you get to a point where it's a necessary food waste, right? If you want to run a five-star restaurant, you do not run out of stuff, and it has to be cooked right. So, so uh, there is a necessary food waste, and, and we know this is big, right, from some of these hotels. It's amazing how much... Amazing. They, Thank you so yeah. much. That's amazing. <laughs> Thank you, Brother Gozzi. So just behind you, you have two. Yeah, so you've got three... And Diana. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, I'm just curious. I was, you know, I'm watching the one of videos this afternoon, which is uh, what I see from there. It look like simple, but I know it's not that simple. For example, and how you, it's about uh, more about the technical, technical thing. Like for example. I saw there you, you collect like curry, like tempeh, something of fresh food in there, a lot of fresh food in there. And then my question is how you maintain the quality of the food, for example. Let's say you, you take from the hotel and then you bring to, to somewhere else, to Tabanan, for example. Of course, you need like, like a fridge or something. And how do you preserve that, for example? That's first one. And then second one, how do you start it? Because to introduce to the people, because I know in Bali, we not, we traditionally, we're not thinking about that. It's kind of like uh, get the food from free from whatever, from hotel and, and so on and so on. And how do you find who will need this food? It's kind of like between demand and supply. It is, it's look like it's not that simple. And I'm curious about that. How you do you start that? Oh, thank you. You are right. It is not simple. Uh, first of all, how do we preserve it, right? It's very important. We, we know exactly the max driving time in a truck up into the mountains and so on. We know uh, what temperature it must be at and so on. So, so, of course, we have people in food safety that looks after that, and, and that cannot be diverted. I mean, we have had one truck that blew a tire, and, and uh, well, too bad. We have to trash the food. We cannot take any risks. So, um, yeah, cool chain trucks, uh, people who are dedicated to it, people who love to do this, right? Because they really feel they're making a, an impact on the world. And then um, it's just getting it out there same day. Typically, we do have freezers in our offices in Sanur, but we try to use them as little as possible. So we, we pick it up and we inspect it and make sure it's good and take it to the recipients. Now, the recipients, like I said, 
that is a difficult one because, again, Bali has changed so much, right? With COVID, our world changed, and we had to find out who, who should we now give it to, right? But the, when 80% the of jobs in Bali have always been tourist job, and 80% of those jobs disappeared overnight, right? Our food disappeared. All the hotels closed. In one week, we lost all the food, right? So it has been incredible during COVID. It forced us, unfortunately, to have to also buy some food ingredients. So that means it wasn't taken away from the landfill. But we actually bought it and cooked it with all these volunteers. We had four kitchens at one point. Now we only have one. So the world has changed, but we have to find the recipients. And you're right. How do you do that the best way? Well, we use statistics. We work a lot with the Panjars here. Not so much in Java. There it'll be the deserts and so on. But we find out from government people, from uh, even some of our donors, like some of the hotels, some of their staff says, have you thought about my village or whatever? And, uh, and then we look into it. So we try to do that. The other risk then is when you go and give some barcos, we generally give you know 12 kilos, uh, five kilos of rice and some cooking oil and some cooked food and so on to each person. And uh, it's so easy to go in up the street and give it away for cigarettes, right? But there we, we just have to use statistics. We try to make sure that when we give out a truckload, what is a truckload? A ton, ton and a half, something like that. One truckload, maybe 5% of it goes lost to, to people who do something with it, right? But generally we know, and we can tell because the Banjars are very good at finding the old people that really need it, right? We can, we can tell. When they get picked up by the families, it's, it's, uh, that's one of the blessings of the job, right? You get to see some faces and some amazing uh, villages up in the mountains that really, and they need it, right? But as a good example, we used to go in COVID a lot up into the mountains. During COVID, we realized that we had to change a little bit. People in Denpasar were in much bigger trouble because now they had lost their jobs and uh, they didn't really have any cooking equipment, and they were sitting there, and, and I still believe there might have been people uh, not getting through that in, in Denpasar and, uh, and other uh, city centers. So we switched a lot of it away from, uh, from, from the mountains, where they, after all, can still grow a banana or guava or something. They can get through it, right? If, if we wanted to, you know, we should be in Africa, where people are dying from hunger, but there's no hotels to pick up from, so we, we came here. So it's all a matter of finding them. And, uh, but I think we've gotten good at it now. But we'll always take ideas if you have some. <laughs> Thank you, Brother Tree. So if you pass my phone, yeah, Diana, over to you, darling. So I know that managing a team that works non-profit or semi-non-profit can be a challenge, especially with a mindset that is quite different. So I know that in America or in Europe, it's more kind of popular to have free guns, like dumpster divers and things like that. And here, I believe, the mindset culturally maybe not there. So what were the biggest challenges for you to manage the team of people that would make this very, you know, when the time is at stake, very demanding job work? What do you mean were the challenges? What were <laughs> are the challenges? Yeah, what, what are the challenges? <laughs> Thank yes. you. The day-to-day -day challenges are clear, right? Our, our general manager in each country have each their segment of, of um, challenges. In Thailand now, it's so big that it is easier. We have the Zero Summit up there, and everybody comes together. We had the Korean food banks come in to speak. So uh, it's just running, and the people there have been around so long. They love their jobs, and they love what we're doing. In the uh, Philippines, which is a newer startup, there's so much enthusiasm about doing this. So uh, we started in Manila, and we'll probably open it up in Cebu now just for that. In Indonesia, it has been a little bit more uh, tricky because uh, the, we had to get people's minds, like you say, into it. And, and NGOs here, and when I say here, I have to say Bali because I don't think it is the same in the rest of Indonesia. Um, but, but there is uh, some people who really get it, and then there are those that are the worker bees. And for in, as an example, we have changed the name. We don't have drivers anymore, right? We have FRAs. Food Rescue Ambassadors, our FRAs. I still say drivers, and they all shh, you know. But Food Rescue Ambassadors go into the kitchen every single day, and they can look at things, and why are you not giving me that up there? Or, you know, how are you today, and so on. But they are very much our ambassador as well. Just like we have food hunters that call on the hotels and manufacturers and supermarkets to get the food, but they have to, it's, it's like selling. 
right? You have to be liked, you have to be a, a good story, a good product, and then you really have to get all that going and then people are gonna bite, whether you're selling or, or getting like we are, right? But it is the same process. And that is a challenge because the, the, yeah, the, the cultures are very different in the three countries and then when you come as a Westerner and think you know it all, no. And that's where maybe the biggest lessons learned over these many, many years has been, yeah, we don't know, right? Because we know how to do it in Denmark, France, Australia, right? But then you come to one of these countries and you have to learn it the hard way. And, and maybe that's the best thing that has happened is that we have locals now. We've gone through many different management uh, layers and so on, but, but locals need to drive it. Then we can come with a business and numbers and all the extra things, right? But it has to be driven by someone who speaks the language and knows the culture. Thank you. Wow. Great. So look, uh, we're going to... Because I, I think there are some people here who want to have a chat to you afterwards. So, so we're going to begin to close. But I, I want to speak about, you know, Viking Sunset Studios. So the thing about this show, right, Speak Up Monday, Destination Indonesia, is that it's about Indonesia, right? And as many of you know me, I'm all about Binika Tunggal Ika, which is unity and diversity. I'm all about Panchasila, the five guiding principles of Indonesia, Right, Goryon Rotong, like there, there is key, um, and obviously Tri Hita Kadana that everyone knows I love to talk about. So it's about this, it's about how do we, and this is also the funding, is how do we come together, right? So how do uh, Indonesians or foreigners come together? That's why I love my brother Gossi over here and Vivian over there. How do we come together, and brother Tree, of course, how do we come together to create projects that uplift and impact everyone as many as possible in a positive, powerful way. So as tourism architect and partnerships architect, I do that in different ways, um, bringing different people together. Uh, there's four aspects, right, so of venture building. One is um, talent, availability of talent. One is availability of capital. The other one is availability of projects. And the other one is availability of leadership. So these four things I bring together on projects and ideally make them sing, right? So knowing this, so, and I know your mindset and heart set as well, because again, I know you. <laughs> so it's not hard, not hard for me to figure it out. So like, so Viking Sunset, and we're talking about film. So we have a mutual friend who's going to be on the show soon, actually, Deborah Gabinetti, who was responsible for bringing Eat, Pray, Love to Bali. Okay, American lady, been living here for 20 years. Bali International Film Festival has been like going for about 18 years from memory. Road to Balinale, look for it. Road to Bali, Balinale is coming soon, so look out for that. But we'll get her on the show so you can meet her. Incredible woman, um, has got this incredible uh, acknowledgement from the Juilliard School in the US, which is another school that is top and has incredible connections uh, in the film industry. I have a friend uh, who's coming here, who's a Hollywood actress, and she's gonna be, uh, we're talking about it now, um, creating this movie. The, the type of movie has never been done here before in Bali. And it's a Hollywood cast which, and uh, behind the scenes, which is Matrix, Star Wars, and uh, one I can't remember. But there are these phenomenal opportunities for this, right? So from that perspective, can you let people know um, what Viking Sunset Studios is, why it exists, and what you're looking to do with it? Yeah. Well, it exists. Let's go back to Denmark High School again, right? When my teachers were telling me to stay in language, don't mess with that mathematics. In my, uh, we, we printed a book at the end of high school, and uh, my uh, fellow students had two words for me. My, my car was held together by tape, which was true, and I wanted to be the new Steven Spielberg. <laughs> well, <laughs> but back then we were doing it with eight I millimeter. I the tape. Oh, <laughs> yeah. I got this vision in my mind. So oh. you, I can see you uh, like, yeah, yes. the tape. And rust, rust is bad over there, right? But so it's always been a dream, and, and I've been an extra in, in a couple of movies and so on. And one day I'm, I'm stuck with Morgan Freeman in, in front of the camera, and, and he, uh, his, his trolley gets stuck. And, and they come out, oh, you can't stand here in the sun, go back to you. He says, no, it's okay. So he turned around and talked to two of us, right? And we had a great conversation. And that just inspired for this. But why are we really doing it? Same as what I realized up in the hotel in Thailand, that somebody needed to 
do something about food, right? Well, looking at what's going on in Asian filmmaking, which is, of course, right now is a rocket, right? Um, there is a lot going on in Thailand, a little bit in Malaysia, uh, a couple of other places, and very, very little here. Now it's getting better. Netflix is investing in, in Indonesia and so on, but mainly in Jakarta. And here I am driving around and really looking at the most beautiful scenery, right? Why do we not have that here? And that's why the thinking is if we build a resort on the beach where the stars can have a beautiful stay, a helipad to take them in and out, and the crews can work there in, in self-contained comfort, then it's a no-brainer. And I really think, uh, I really believe that that's going to fly. So it is basically to attract Hollywood. <laughs> There's no other way to say it. Of course, it's Australians, it's, it's everybody, right? But we need to get professional filmmaking, right? So we started with the, um, the best camera you can buy in Hollywood and put it in Zanur. We have a green screen studio, which is this big, 25 square meters. But, you know, it's a beginning. And, and then it'll grow from there while we're building the big thing up in Tabanan. Brilliant. Love it, love it. Ooh. So look, um, as we begin uh, to wrap up this week's show, just want to thank everybody here. Um, Tropical Nomad, Brother Guzman, Sister Ayu, Brother Ichi, who's around here in spirit. You know, remember Bella as well. Bella, I think, is here in spirit. <laughs> and thank you to you, uh, the, the audience. I kind of know all of your names. Um, really appreciate it. And those watching at home. So remember, this goes live on three platforms simultaneously. So you've got Instagram Live, YouTube Live, and Facebook Live. So feel free uh, to share this. Uh, feel free to come to Tropical Nomad. Drop-in is free. So there's no entry fee. There's no RSVP, though you might fill out your details on the way in if you want. And, and yeah, it's a, it's a great place to be. And it's the people that you meet afterwards. And that's really why you come, because this is a bit like a birthday party, right? Some weeks we have, I think the most we've had here has been 100 people, right? And then, as Carol knows, right, the blockchain ones, and, right? And then the, one, the other ones, which I feel is equally, if not more important, get less. But that's okay, because it's like a birthday party, right? The ones who show up are the ones who are supposed to show up. But the key is, is that you talk to each other, right? Because if you just step up and say, thanks, that was great, and walk away, you're missing out on the most important and vital ingredient, which is the person sitting next to you is often the one that you actually just might need or the person that can help contribute to you in a way that you didn't even realize. So one thing I would say is that come, hang out. If a title kind of draws you and you feel the pull, give in. <laughs> give in to the pull. Surrender to the pull. Come in. There's someone here that you're supposed to, you're supposed to meet. You want to say something? I can yes, feel? I just have one last thing yeah. because the funding... Giving back to Bali is so important, right? And you will do that by what you're doing in the funding, right? I didn't get to say the studio is the same. A studio is basically the communications mouthpiece of SOS. But this is all about communication. If we don't get the ideas out there, if we don't get the support, but also new innovations going, it'll never change. So what you're doing here every week is very important. So thank, thank you. you from Bali. Thank you, my brother. <laughs> thank you, sister. Thank you, brother. Perfect spot to end the show. We've done the round of applause already. So thank you. Look forward to seeing you next week. Thank you so much. Lots of love here from Bali. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.